Can you say that again, church? Amen. Trish, it was just as beautiful at second service as it was at first service. Aren't you thankful for a heavenly Father whose eye is on the sparrow and is looking over each one of us? Well, happy Sabbath, church. What a high Sabbath. We got ministry and or worship in the morning, and this afternoon we have the opportunity to go out and minister to our community. We have small groups starting. God is on the move in our church. What do you say? If you guys could pull me back just a little bit so that I'm not blasting my own eardrums as well as everyone else's, just a touch more if you would. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Well, uh, what a week. I saw some headlines this last week that we are at in the last month, 54 mass shootings in the last 30 days. I can't even believe I'm saying that. Jesus is coming soon, church. Um, we have more protests and tensions on the rise. Jesus is coming soon. Cases in Michigan, at least, are rising significantly right now. Something we don't need to be afraid of because we can trust in our Heavenly Father's care. Amen, church? You know, something that, I, that struck me the other day, it, it was a good reminder, it's something I think all of us know, but it's good to remember this. Even in a pandemic, the life, my life is in the hands of God. And nothing can take my life without God's permission, even a virus. Now, it doesn't mean that we get all careless, but it does mean that if ministry is to happen and there's something coming between me and ministry called COVID-19, church, what should I choose? Ministry, God, however you want to put it. We need to win souls for Christ. Jesus is coming soon. I'm proud of our young people. They're meeting right now doing PBE. They've memorized vast portions of the Bible. I hope you're praying for them. Two weekends from now, we have a huge rally for evangelism. Don't miss it. Chris Holland will be here in person and is going to be preaching a powerful message, reminding us and preparing us for the evangelistic series coming in one year. Jesus is coming soon. God is moving in this church, and I hope you are part of what God is doing. Amen? Well, today, we're going to continue our series in the Ten Commandments, and as we begin, would you bow your heads with me as we ask God to guide? Heavenly Father, You're coming soon. And today we need Jesus. I need him to give the message for today. My brothers and sisters here need, need the Holy Spirit to take the message and make it uniquely applied to each one here. That, that we'll walk away with a deeper appreciation of Jesus' love and a greater understanding of how we can draw close to you and the mission for this time. Thank you for the angels that are pressing close. Thank you for the rejoicing in heaven over the baptism. Hide me behind the cross. Speak to our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, right there at the beginning of your Bible. I saw some stats earlier this week as I was preparing for this sermon and they're similar to stats I've seen quite a while ago, uh, that people are stressed and concerned. For some, the pandemic has been a time of, great, I've been able to reconnect with my family, and that, that's been good. For others, the pandemic has been extremely stressful and concerning. For some, it's been a time of relaxation. For others, it's been a time of extreme busyness. As I look at the mess in our world right now and I see the tension rising between different individuals and different, different groups, you know, in heaven I'm so glad that there isn't going to be any, any tension between different parties, aren't you? There's not going to be the, this angel party and that angel party. We're all going to be Jesus party, amen? amen. <laughs> but as we see all of that, there's a place in the Bible that we find that God established a palace in time, a a crystal in time, if you could, a time crystal, if you could, that, that, that God has established to remind us that He is the creator of all of us, He is the uniter of all of us, and He is the great reestablisher 
when we are broken, he has a time in the week that he says, this is the time where you can focus on my healing power in your life. When we are discouraged, he has a time when he says, this is when I can lift you up and restore you back to who you should be. When you are are feeling like everything has fallen apart and that you are useless to God. He has a palace in time to remind you that he, you are so valuable that God was willing to die that you might live forever with him. Genesis chapter 2, are you there? As the, hand, as the earth came forth from the hand of the Creator, we, we spent some time at prayer meeting going through the creation week, discovered some really powerful things. I'll just summarize it for you here. You'll notice that if you go through the creation week, God creates... And then he fills. What do I mean by that? Someone tell me, what did God create on the first day of creation? Light. And he created the first day. God created the first day and he created light. What did God create on the second day? Someone tell me quickly, what did he create on the second day? Okay, we need to go look in our Bibles. Let's go look in our Bibles. That's okay. Genesis chapter 1. Are you there, church? What did verse 9, uh, verse 6, what did God create on the second day? Someone tell me quickly. The firmament. Take a brief, deep breath of air. <sighs> That's the firmament. That's the air around us. God created the air. What did God create on the third day? Someone tell, tell me quickly. Dry land. So, first day, light. Second day, air with dividing the waters. Third day, land. Now, if you go to the fourth day, what does God fill the light with sun, moon, and stars. What does God create on fill the air and the water with on the fifth day? Birds and fish. And then we come, what does God fill the land with on the sixth day? Animals and finally mankind. So if you do if you if you rebuild a pyramid, you've got on the bottom here you have first day light. And over here, fourth day, sun, moon, and stars. And then if you were to go up one, you'd have on the second day, God created the air, separating the waters. And over here, you'd have the, the fish and the birds. And then you'd go up another layer, and you'd have over here, you'd have the third day, God created the land. And over here, you'd have day six, he created the, the plants and the animals. And then the top of the triangle is this crowning act of creation. Genesis chapter 2. You see... God takes all of this, but if he had stopped creating with the sixth day, his creation would not have been perfect. Because if you only have things without a relationship with the creator of all things, you're missing out on everything. You know, a lot of us may have a lot of things in our lives that God has blessed us with. But if we're not building a relationship with the God of all things, we are missing out, church, on everything that's important. Adam and Eve, if they had just had the creation and not the Sabbath, it wouldn't have been perfect. And so God does something very special. You realize Adam and Eve did see God create something. A lot of people don't realize that God didn't just create things, but he also created how we count Time, the week. He created the first day. He created the second day. Created the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day. But God also, in the presence of Adam and Eve, creates which day? The seventh day. They watch him create it. To me, that's one of the most powerful um, examples or evidences in the Bible that the Sabbath is God's gift to mankind. So I want us to focus in on this point number one. God made the Sabbath for man. Let's read Genesis 2, 1 and through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the, what's it say there, church? Seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God, what's it say there, church? Blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. What an incredible day that must have been. Can you imagine spending the first Sabbath with Jesus there in the perfection of Eden? 
And God takes time. He says, Adam and Eve, I want you to understand this day is specially set aside. In this day, I have extra blessings for you. This is the day where if you are struggling, I will fill you with more than you can imagine. Here you will feel my love more than you've ever felt it before. Church, what a privilege the Sabbath is for God's people. It's all about the relationship that we're building with Jesus. It's not a works thing. It's a rest thing in Jesus. In fact, I would submit, this is a side, this isn't where we're going in the sermon, but I would submit, church, that keeping any other day than Sabbath is my works instead of God's rest. Any other day that's kept instead of Sabbath is a works-based Christianity, not a faith-based Christianity. You see what Satan has done? Just chasing this rabbit a little bit longer. What Satan has done is he's, he's accused those who are just trying to follow what Jesus says of the very thing that, that those who are doing the opposite are. We follow Jesus by faith. And, and we should say, not always, but we should say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. Isn't that what we should say, church? That's faith. That's living by faith. Go with me to Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Christ, God made the Sabbath for man. He set it aside for mankind because without it, we wouldn't be able to, to have the relationship with God that we needed. In fact, Christ brings this point home crystal clear in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Notice what Christ says as he, he drives this point home. His disciples have been walking in a grain field. While you're turning there to Mark chapter 2, verse 27, just a little recap of the story. His disciples are walking in a grain field, and they're plucking grain on the Sabbath. And the scribes and Pharisees come, and they say, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You're not supposed to do this. And they had an incorrect view of Sabbath keeping, and that's a sermon for another time. But in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Christ points out the importance of understanding the why of Sabbath. Verse 27, are you there, church? And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for who? Not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, verse 28, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. God came to the end of his creation and he creates man. And then he did one more thing. He created the Sabbath for his people. And he made it a time for us to connect. Have you ever wondered how you can get the greatest blessing out of Sabbath? Have you ever thought maybe, you know, maybe I'm missing out on some of what God has for me? Some, some of us think that Sabbath keeping is coming to church, amen, that's important. And then taking a, a hike to the, to the bed springs. And we rest, and that's it. But I'd like us today to, to look at the Bible, and I would like us to submit that there is more to Sabbath keeping than just those two things. And I am hopeful that as you come out of this sermon, you are inspired with some new ways to look at keeping the Sabbath that will bring the Sabbath alive to you, and you'll discover that there is tremendous blessings in the Sabbath that you've missed out on all this time that now God wants to bring alive for you. So God created, God made the Sabbath for man, and he made it, I'm going to submit, for three things. First, God made it the Sabbath for rest. It is a time when we are to put aside our, our secular activities, and we are to rest in Jesus. That's why the Sabbath starts at sundown Friday night. Because as the sun goes down, we rest over the night and get the energy we need for the next day. Are you with me, church? God wants us to rest, but that rest is to prepare us to enter into the joy of the Sabbath as the sun comes up the next morning. So he creates it for rest. Point number two, God creates the Sabbath for worship. Go with me to um, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. There's many passages we could have gone to, but I want you to see that Christ was, was always worshiping on Sabbath with his heavenly Father. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And when you're there, if you'd let me know by saying amen. 
Some of you are there. Here's some pages turning, so I'll give you just a little bit more time. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. This is when Christ is actually announcing his ministry right after he's been in the wilderness. Now notice what it says. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his, what's it say there, church? Custom. Now what does the word custom mean? Does this mean that it was something he did occasionally? He did perpetually. It's a custom. It's something he always did. What Christ's custom, and then Luke's about to tell us what it was. Notice what Christ says. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the what? Sabbath day. Now, what did you do in the synagogue? You worship together as a family. And he stood up to read. Christ's custom was to go to church on Sabbath. You can write this down and look this up later in your notes. Acts chapter 17 and verse 2. Um, Paul's custom was to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Christ and the disciples. In fact, I would submit, if you were to to look through the Bible, the men and women of God throughout history have a custom of being with God's people in church on Sabbath, worshiping the great king of the universe. In fact, Paul in the book of Hebrews, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, points out how important this, this worship is. Let's start in verse 24. When you're there in Hebrews chapter 10, going in the New Testament, fast-forwarding several books before the book of James, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Pause. Look around the room. What is the Apostle Paul calling us to do here in verse 24? Consider who? The people around you. To what? Not to sit there and judge them, but to do what? To love them. A church family is to be a place where the love of Christ is brought out fully. Notice I said is to be. Are you with me, church? It may not always be that, but we are to strive for that. Amen? Now, notice verse 25. Now he brings this point. How do we do that? Verse 25. Not forsaking the what? Assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Church, we are to be here to worship, not just for our own edification, but because as a family we need each other. We need each other. The fellowship here. In worship, God does special things. He pours His Spirit out upon us. He anoints us with His grace. He inspires us to go forth into ministry. He challenges us with truths from His Word. Worshiping together is so vital to the development of Christian character. First Chronicles chapter 16. I want to touch briefly on what we do during worship. So 1 Chronicles, go back to the Old Testament. It's this incredible story that you're going to find. 1 Chronicles chapter 16. David has just brought the ark back and put it in the tabernacle. And they're about to praise and worship God. And I want you, as I read these few verses to encapsulate and understand when we come to worship God, what God wants us to bring with ourselves and how we are to approach His throne as we worship. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 8. When you're there, if you'd say amen. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Sing to Him. Sing psalms to Him. Talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face, what church? Evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servants. You children of Jacob, his chosen one. He is the Lord our what? God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenants forever the word which he has commanded for a thousand 
generations. When we come to church, we're to come with a praise on our lips of what God has done for us. In fact, as I was studying for this, I shared this in first service, I was convicted that we do not do enough praising of God in church. Um, the early Adv uh, the Methodist church for many years, and then the early Adventists would to carry this on, they would do, um, for church, they would do what they called a social meeting. It was a time of testimony sharing. They'd start off with a short sermon, oftentimes, and then after the sermon, they would take however much time, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes sometimes, and people would get up and share how God had moved in their life that last week. In Battle Creek, at the Battle Creek Tabernacle, where they had hundreds and hundreds, probably several thousand there, they had a Sabbath. Ellen White wrote about it. It was so powerful. She said 186 people shared their testimony of what God had done in their lives over that last week. Can you imagine being in a church service like that? You may have had a rough week, but then you hear how God has moved in someone else's life, and you're like, wow, God is still, still caring. That inspires me that God still loves me, too. And then the next week, you may have had a powerful week, and you share that testimony that encourages someone else. Church, it's something I'm thinking and praying about. I think if we were to bring this in and, and maybe have a couple of church services where we share what God is doing, can you imagine how electrifying that would be to hear what God is doing? We need to come with praise on our lips of what the great and powerful God has done and is doing. Let's review. Church, the Sabbath is for rest. The Sabbath is for worship. In the final moments of our time together, the Sabbath is for ministry. John chapter 5. There, the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 5. Turn there with me if you would. We find the story of the man by the pool of Bethesda. You know, to understand how to keep the Sabbath, we really don't need to look any farther than Jesus Christ. He is our great example. What did Jesus do on Sabbath? Well, we already know. Where did he go? He went to the synagogue. He went and he worshipped. But what else did Jesus do on Sabbath? Well, John chapter 5 gets us an insight. And there's many other stories like this of what something Christ did on Sabbath. Christ ministered on Sabbath. John chapter 5. Are you there, church? After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. It's a Sabbath morning. For the sake of time, I'll just summarize the next few verses. Christ is out walking. It appears that he's on his way to church. And as he's walking, he is in Jerusalem, and he passes by the pool of Bethesda. And he sees a vast multitude of people who are sick and broken. Christ would have loved to have healed everyone. The Desire of Ages says he knew that it would cut his ministry short, so he couldn't. But he sees one man that is of extreme, an extreme case. For 38 years, he's been a paralytic. For 38 years, he's been dependent on others in pain. And Christ, in verse 7, 6, 7, and 8, comes over. And he bends over that man. And he ministers to a broken human being's need on the Sabbath. Sabbath is not just about rest. Sabbath is not just about worship. The Sabbath is about ministry. It's the day we are to, above all others, minister to the broken humanity around us. Let's read 7 and 8. Uh, John chapter 5, 7, 8, and 9. Then the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus answered unto him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Reading aloud with me, verse 9. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Can I be real with you all for a moment? Not that I haven't been real before. That sounded wrong. You all know what I mean. I think sometimes our Sabbath keeping has been very selfish. It's more about what I want and what I desire than what God wants and what God can do through me to touch other people.
we're more worried about getting our Sabbath afternoon nap in than about seeing if there's someone we can make a difference in their lives. And church, I'm, I'm not pointing any fingers at anyone here. If you think that I'm preaching right at you, I'm not. I'm preaching at me and the Holy Spirit's talking to your heart. Sabbath keeping, go with me to Isaiah chapter 58. Let's follow this a little bit longer. Isaiah chapter 58. Sabbath keeping is is not the time for me to selfishly hold on to what I want. It's for me to go and look for people who are in need and broken and share with them the love of Christ. Are you there in Isaiah chapter 58? If you're having trouble finding it, it's right there in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah 58 is really the breakdown of how to do Sabbath keeping. And it ends, verse 13 and 14, with directly referencing the Sabbath. But I want you to notice verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. And I'm going to pause and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts as we then read these words. Father in heaven, as we, we've prayed at the beginning of the sermon, but right now we're about to look at a few more verses here that are directly impactful to all of us and have been very convicting to me. And I pray that you will speak to our hearts and that you will help us to not just hear, but then act on what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice what, this is the Lord speaking, this is Jesus speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of what, church? Wickedness. To undo the heavy burden and to let the oppressed go where? Free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the who, church? Hungry. And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. Pastor, I can't have anyone over. Church, if they're poor, they don't care what your house looks like. Just show them the love of Christ. What do you say? When you see the naked, that you what? Cover him. And you not hide yourself from your own flesh. Now notice verse 8. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, and your healing shall spring forth what? Speedily. Now church, don't miss this. This is incredibly important. Are you afraid or worried about COVID-19? You may be. But the promise here is as you keep the Sabbath in the ways that God has has ordained, He will heal you speedily. What do you say? Read the rest of it. Your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Don't let COVID-19 stop you from doing ministry on Sabbath. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say what? Here I am. I want Jesus to hear my cries, don't you? I want the, the healing power of the Holy Spirit flowing through my body and healing all the brokenness that I have inside, don't you? I want the Lord to be my rear guard. How do we get there? By doing verses 6 and 7. So let's review. Sabbath is for rest. That's why it starts at sundown, so we can rest overnight. The Sabbath is for worship, where we come together and we fellowship and we praise God and we study His Word. And the Sabbath is for ministry when we go out and we make a difference in the broken people around us. We partake in the ministry of Christ. I need to touch on one other thing, what we shouldn't do on Sabbath, and then we will come to the final appeal. Go with me to Nehemiah chapter 13. This will just take but a moment, but it's very important that we touch on this. Nehemiah is in the Jerusalem, is with the children, uh, I should say, with the Jews. They've come back from Babylon. They're now reestablishing in Israel. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, he sees something happening that's very distressing. Verse 15. Now, you may be having trouble with find Nehemiah. It's not a book we go to very often, so I'll tell you how to get there. Go to 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You'll then find a little book called Ezra, and then you'll land in Nehemiah. 
Okay? So hopefully that helps you get there. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 15. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading winepress on the what, church? On the Sabbath. Bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wines, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they had brought into Jerusalem on the... What's happening here? You have people who are going about their various activities because it's more convenient to do it on the weekend, I guess, or that's when more people are available, I don't know. But they're doing buying and selling, they're doing their business on whose day? God's day. Now God made the day for us, but it's that day that we're to have in a palace of time to connect with Jesus, not be going about selling and buying. So I, Nehemiah says, and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who bought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the, to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Now verse 18 is very um, interesting to me. Notice verse 18. Did not your fathers do what? Thus. And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the what, church? What happened? God could not pour out his blessings because his people had been profaning his Sabbath. In fact, he couldn't protect them from the enemies that came and took them captive because they were profaning his Sabbath. Maybe your home is under attack today. Then I would challenge you, look and see, am I honoring this palace in time that will allow God to restore his protection in my home? Sabbath is not a day that we should be going out to eat. Shouldn't do it. It's not a day that we should be going and buying things. Now, if there is an emergency and someone's life is on the line and they're about to die and you need to pick up some life-saving medication, that's different, church. Are you with me? we to save life. But in any other, plan the week before. Don't run and buy some mayonnaise because you ran out. Or some ketchup. Or pay someone else to serve you food who should be worshiping God themselves. Go with me to Isaiah 58, our last verse together. Verse 13 and 14. God puts a condition and then a promise that I believe over every one of us want answered in our lives. Isaiah 58 if you ever are looking for Isaiah and you have trouble finding it, it's almost always just about the middle of your Bible. Some Bibles have more at the end, so it's a little less, but it's close to the middle. Isaiah 58, are you there? I want you to read aloud with me verse 13 and 14. I know we have different translations here. It will probably be on the screen here in a moment. Let's read it together off the screen. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, verse 14, nor speaking your own words. Now we'll go to verse 14. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you, keep reading, with the heritage of Jacob your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Leave verse 14 up there. Church, do you want these blessings of God in your life? Then let's keep the Sabbath in God's way. God made the Sabbath for man. He calls us to rest on the Sabbath at sundown until the next morning. He calls us to worship him together as a church on the Sabbath. And finally, he calls us to minister to the broken humanity, especially on the Sabbath. Was it Exodus chapter 20, verse 8? Say it begins right there. The fourth commandment begins with that one word, remember. Why? Because God knows that in our brokenness and in my selfishness, I'm easily going to forget the Sabbath. But today, today, 
God's voice is speaking to our hearts and he's saying, church, will you let this go? Will you enter into my rest through worship, through ministry? And will you find in the Sabbath all the blessings that I have to pour out on you? I have a couple of appeal questions. One, how many of you want God's blessing in your life? Let me see your hands. Okay, amen. So do I. You can put your hands down. Now the next question. How many of you would join me, because I had to make this decision this last week as well, and say, Lord, I want, by your grace, to enter more fully into the keeping of the Sabbath. If that's your desire, would you stand as we close with prayer? Father in heaven, we stand here in your presence. We've read your word. We've been challenged by your word. Some of us have realized that we've missed out on so much over the years. But you promised to redeem the time. You promised to forgive us and to cleanse us, and today those blessings can begin. Father, as we enter into the joy of keeping the Sabbath, we've worshipped, we rested last night, now this afternoon, may we not be wait for someone to tell us how to do it, but may you inspire us. Maybe it's a, a neighbor that we know has lost someone recently and needs a comforting hand. Maybe it's someone on the side of the road while we're driving home. Maybe it's the outreach this afternoon that you've called us to be a part of. Whatever it is, you see us standing. Teach us now how to enter fully in to what we've committed to do. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to remain standing as our song leaders come up here. We're going to sing that beautiful hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Jesus shines pure 
than all creation, your name is most holy. In your presence, all of sin is condemned, but we are forgiven. I ask that you will send us from this place with the presence and power of your spirit. I ask that you angels will attend the steps of each one here. May you bless our homes and our marriages, and our children. Father, our grandchildren that may be, our children that may be wandering away from you, we ask in Jesus' mighty name that you will bring them back. We pray that the fair, lovely, beautiful, transforming presence of Jesus will go with us from this place, will dwell in our homes and our hearts, and will bring us back again Unitedly for you, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless each one of you. Thank you for coming and worshiping together here in God's house. This afternoon, take the message to heart and find a way to minister to those who are in need and watch how God shines His face upon you in a special way. God bless you. Happy New Week. Happy Sabbath.